Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he, for our sake, was made to be sin who knew no sin. And as we eat and take this bread together, Father, we pray that it would be a helpful reminder to us of the body of Christ on that cross, where he suffered so that we could go free, where he suffered so that our sins could be totally taken away and removed, and we could be given that righteousness of God. Father, we pray that as we eat this bread, you would give us the right hearts and minds and attitudes, that we would ponder Christ, and that we would rejoice in his mercy and his grace and his willingness to die. And Father, we pray that there would be perhaps an element of sorrow and sadness as well, that our sins drove him to that cross. But Father, we pray that our sorrow would be swallowed up in rejoicing, in rejoicing that Christ died, that we could go free, and that he rose again into everlasting life. So Father, we pray you would bless this bread to us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll give thanks for the cup and then when we receive it, we'll hold on to it and drink together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup, which we can have as a reminder of the blood of Christ. Father, we know that the life is in the blood and Christ was willing to shed his blood and to lose his life there on that cross. Father, we thank you that it is a picture of how our sins can be washed clean. Although we are filthy in sin, Although we are dirty and stained, the blood of Christ can wash us clean so that we become the righteousness of God. Father, we thank you that we can drink it together, remembering that we're not just saved individually, but you are saving a church and a people, a family for yourself. Father, we thank you that you have made us part of this family through the blood of Christ. So, Father, we pray that you would bless this cup to us now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this simple ceremony. We thank you for this time we can have remembering the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We want to praise you for our Saviour this morning. Father, we thank you that as we eat and as we drink, we're reminded that this salvation is not something, um, not just an, an idea or a concept, but it is real and living for us. Thank you for all that Christ has done. And may you bless us as we continue to worship him this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to continue by reading Psalm 146. I have a bit of a problem with the Psalms, and that's that almost every one I read, I decide is my new favourite Psalm, because they're all so wonderful, aren't they? Uh, but Psalm 146 is one um, my family's been reading, and we've been trying to learn together. So we'll read Psalm 146 together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. Well, we're going to do that together by singing our next hymn, uh, number 23, O God Beyond All Praising.
Now this morning I have a verse which I'd like us to try and remember together, to learn together. It's a very simple one, and it's not even a whole verse. I've just picked a section of a verse, just a few words. And here it is. My verse today is, Give thanks in all circumstances. And this comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. Can you say it together with me? Give thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Now it tells us there to give thanks. I wonder how often in your life you give thanks or say thank you. It's good to say thank you when you've been given some dinner or some nice food. It's good to say thank you to God. It's good to say thank you to mum or dad who may have made it as well. Um, it's good to say thank you when you get a Christmas present, isn't it? When someone gives you a present, um, regardless of if it's what you want or not, you should still say thank you, shouldn't you? Because someone's been kind enough to go shopping and get you a present. And this verse says we should give thanks. I'm sure there are lots of other times when we give thanks. Now, we've just finished a year, haven't we? 2023 has come to an end. And I don't know if it went quickly for you. Or if it went slowly, I think in reality it actually went exactly the same for all of us, didn't it? But sometimes it can feel to go really quick. I find the few days leading up to Christmas, it goes so slow, doesn't it? Time seems to slow right down. And then the minute it's Christmas Day morning and you've woken up, time speeds up again and it flies by. And you know, I'm back to work again now. And oh, I wish I was on holiday again. So 2023. I wonder what things, looking back at this past year, you can be thankful for. Do you want to give me some examples? What things from this past year can you be thankful for? Holidays. Holidays. That's a good one. Holidays. Mm. We love a good holiday to get away from all. We can be thankful for our holidays. What else can we give thanks for from last year? Sorry? The breath that we breathe, yeah, happens all the time, doesn't it? And we take it for granted. Imagine how many breaths you must have taken last year. And God gave them to you. We can say thank you for that. What else? Families. Sorry? Families. Families, yeah, that's a very good one, isn't it? We can give thanks for our families. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Good food and bad food as well sometimes, but good food, yeah. Do you know, I really enjoyed my Christmas dinner. I had pigs in blankets. Do you like pigs in blankets? You know, they're not real pigs. Well, they are, but they're not the whole pig. A little, a little sausage wrapped up. And they're not in blankets. I don't know why they're called pigs in blankets, but the bacon's delicious, isn't it? And I, I love roast parsnips. I enjoyed that. Yeah, good food. Absolutely. What else can we give thanks for? Lord Jesus Christ. Mmm. Jesus Christ, that's actually, you've jumped ahead to the bottom of what I was going to say, yeah, that's the thing we can give thanks for the most, the Lord Jesus who's saved us, who's forgiven us, who's taken away our sins and laid them on himself, that is a wonderful thing to give thanks for, for Jesus and that he's been with us this past year. Anything else we can say thank you for? Mm. Absolutely, yeah, um, we can be thankful for loved ones surviving and for health, can't we? When I get a cold, I get a bit miserable sometimes. Uh, and actually, I, I have to remind myself, I've been well most of the days this year, and although I've got a little bit of the sniffles, it could be much, much worse, and it's not the end of the world, and I should give thanks for the health that God gives me. What else can we give thanks for? Our friends, each other here, the church, yeah, that's good. You know, at at my, um, the church I go to, we had a prayer meeting this week, and someone said, let's go through and think of all the things we can give thanks for, from, for as a church for the last year. And after a little while, some various things were said, and somebody said that the door is still open. And I couldn't help myself, but I piped up with, I thought I felt a draft on the back of my neck. <laughs> uh, but it's true, isn't it? It's wonderful to have the door metaphorically open so we can keep coming into church. That's wonderful, isn't it? To meet together. Was there another one over there? Yeah? Sorry? For making us. For making us. Yeah, that's a wonderful one. That God's made us at all. That's brilliant. 
No one's mentioned Christmas presents, but I'm sure you had some good ones that you can say thank you for, yeah? I got a coat, I got a wok, I've been using my new wok, so I've got things I can be thankful for. Well, this verse says, give thanks in all circumstances. Now, we've thought a little bit about the give thanks, but let's just think about the next bit for a moment. It says there, in all circumstances. That means that we should give thanks when things are good, but also when things are bad. It means we should give thanks when we're feeling healthy and when we're feeling a little bit ill. We should give thanks when we're with friends and family and people we like and get on with, but we should also give thanks when we spend time with people we don't like so much and people who perhaps are sometimes a little bit unkind to us. We should give thanks for that too. Now that's a lot harder, isn't it? Let me just tell you about two people very briefly. You've probably heard of them. One is called Corrie, Corrie Ten Boom. Have you heard of her? Yeah? A few nods. Corrie Ten Boom lived in Holland in the Second World War, and the Nazis were arresting people who were Jewish and throwing them into a concentration camp, a horrible place to be, and they were often killing them as well. Now Corrie, what she and her family did, is they took some of these people and they hid them in their homes. So perhaps if you play hide and seek in your house, you might hide in a cupboard or under the stairs or I don't know where you hide, in the wardrobe, all sorts of places. Corrie and her family made some hiding places in their house and they hid Jewish people and they saved many, many people. But eventually the Nazis worked out what was going on and they arrested Corrie and her sister Betty and I think their parents as well. Now, Corrie and Betty were in one of these concentration camps, and there was a big dormitory where they had to sleep with lots of other people. And in that dormitory, there were fleas. Now, fleas bite, and fleas aren't very nice. But, you know, Corrie and Betty said, we thank God for the fleas. Now, what a strange thing to thank God for, for fleas. But the reason they said that was because there were so many fleas in their dormitory, the Nazi guards wouldn't come inside. They didn't want to get bitten. So the Nazis stayed outside and wouldn't come in. And so uh, Corrie and Betty and all the others there were able to hold Bible studies and have peace and quiet in their dormitory because of the fleas. So she said, I thank God for the fleas. A bit like our verse said, give thanks in all circumstances. Now let me tell you about someone else. Her name is Johnny. You might think that's a boy's name because her dad really wanted a boy. But it's spelt J-O-N-I. Johnny Erickson Tarder. Have you heard of her? Probably have. A long time ago, well, quite a number of years ago, when she was young, she went swimming. And she went onto a platform out near the sea and she dived into the sea. She was really good at swimming and diving, but she'd misjudged it. And she hit the, the, the under the water, the ground, and she injured herself terribly and she was paralysed. And she's still alive to this day, and she's still paralyzed. She can't move all her limbs, her, her legs, her feet. She can't move her neck very well. She can't do many of the things that most of us can. And, you know, this is something she said. Johnny said, I'm grateful for my disability. I think, how on earth could she say that? What a bizarre thing to say. But the reason she said that is because every day she's forced to rely on Jesus. Every day she's forced to pray. Every day she's forced to trust Jesus because she can't manage on her own. She needs the Lord Jesus. And she said, I'm grateful for my disability because it makes me trust Jesus all the more. So our verse says, give thanks, not just when things are good, but give thanks in all circumstances. And as we look back at the year that's just gone, there are so many things we can give thanks for. And as we look forward to 2024, I'm sure there are many, many things we can give thanks for now and we'll be able to give thanks for too. But as we've already said, the greatest thing we can thank God for is that he sent his son into this world to die for us so that we could know God, so that we could be friends with God, so that we could go to heaven when we die. Well, let's come to God now and say thank you for some of these things together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the year that's just gone. We want to thank you for all of your mercies, 
all of the good things that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for our family and our friends. Thank you for the health and the breath that you've given to us. Thank you for, for food. Thank you for homes and clothes. Thank you for work. Thank you for school. Father, we thank you for even the difficulties that we've experienced and the ways that they've driven us towards you. Father, we pray that you would teach us to give thanks in all circumstances. Whatever's happening, help us to be those that thank you and praise you, we ask. We thank you, Lord, for the church here and for the opportunities to worship you each Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for fellowship together, for unity around the gospel and around the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for people to speak, people to lead Bible studies. We thank you, Lord, for the children's work here and for all those that have been involved. And Father, looking forward to this week and, and the coming year as well, we thank you, Lord, that you will provide for us in so many ways. We pray, Lord, for this coming week. Uh, we pray for those speaking, uh, Nigel, next week. Lord, we pray for the, the Bible study, for the community outreach lunch coming up, for the Adventurers Children's Club. Father, we pray in each of these things, you would be at work and you would be glorified. Father, we pray most of all in the busyness of church life, in the busyness of 2024. Father, we pray that we would be those who rejoice in the Lord Jesus. We pray that we would be those who love him, who know him, who trust him day by day with the ups and the downs, we ask. So, Father, we pray that you would give us thankful hearts, that we would live rejoicing, that we are your people, we are Christians. Father, we thank you for all these things, and we pray that you'd be with us throughout our service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing number 514. I don't know that I've ever sung this before, so it's the first time today. Born by the Holy Spirit's breath, loosed from the law of sin and death, now cleared in Christ from every claim, no judgment stands against our name. This is a hymn looking at what the Holy Spirit has done through Christ in us in bringing salvation. So we'll sing together.
Now, I've been given this morning, uh, I think, your New Year's message, your New Year's text to speak on, and I see it's beautifully displayed up here on the wall, so well done for all your hard work in getting that hanging there. Um, We're going to read a little bit more than just that one verse. We're going to give some context, so we're going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, and we're going to read from verse 16 down to verse 28. Ezekiel's not always the easiest book, it has to be said, and uh, when I was given this passage initially, I thought, oh no, Ezekiel, Uh, but I've been blessed by looking at this, and I trust you will be as well. So we'll read Ezekiel chapter 36, and starting at verse 16. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, They defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land, for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed through the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that people said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into their own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. In a, in, a, in a little bit, we'll be looking at that together and trust that the Lord will bless us as we do so. But first, we're going to sing number 326. This is a prayer, isn't it, that God the Holy Spirit would come and work within us and give us understanding this morning. Come down, O love divine, and seek this soul of mine and visit it with your own ardour glowing. O comforter, draw near, and within my heart appear and kindle it to your holy flame bestowing. We'll sing together.
Well, Ezekiel was a prophet to a group of exiles who had been stranded in a faraway land, far, far away from their home. They'd lost their their homes, they'd lost their, their families, they'd lost their nation, their nation had been totally uprooted and removed. They'd lost their security. In a sense, they'd lost their future. And why were they there? Why had they been ripped up and taken to a faraway place? Well, first and foremost, it was because of a problem with the heart. It was a heart problem. Now, when the Bible talks about the heart, most of the time, it's not talking about the thing in the center of your body that beats quite regularly, uh, that pumps the blood all around you. No, most of the time, the Bible's not talking about the center of your physical body, but the center of your inner person, the center of who you really are, the combination of your emotions, your will, your attitudes, your desires, all of those things which really make you tick. And Ezekiel is saying here that these Jewish exiles who he's speaking to, they've got a problem in their inner person, in who they really are. And if we were to read through Ezekiel 1 through to chapter 35, we'd start to see that problem of the heart developing we'd see that the Jewish people had started to worship idols. So instead of worshipping the God of heaven, the one who created them, the one who had given them their nation in the first place, they'd started making gods, lowercase g, out of wood and stone and metal. And instead of worshipping the true God, they were just worshipping lumps of, of material. And really, they were worshipping themselves as well. And we'd see in those chapters that in many instances, the leaders and the people had become corrupt. They were obsessed with money and with power. They were the things that were really driving them instead of living for God. And we'd see that there was immorality amongst the people. Things that are not good to talk about because they're so horrible immorality amongst the nation and we read in chapter 36 how God's name was being trashed people were looking at the Jews and they were saying well if that's what God's people are like I don't think much to their God if they've been ripped out of their country well clearly their God is weak and powerless and a bit pathetic and so God's name was being trashed because of the heart problem of these Jews But wonderfully, mercifully, here in chapter 36, God promises to come to these people and to deal with that problem, to deal with their hearts in a way that is kind and loving and just wonderful. Now, in the verses around the one we're looking at, he also gives lots of other promises as well. So he promises to give them a place, a place to live. He promises to give them his presence with them. He promises to give them provisions, stuff to help them live. And actually more than that, he promises them plenty as well. So there's all sorts of promises wrapped up in this chapter. But we're really just going to focus on on the one uh, in verse 26 this morning. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. My question for us to consider this morning is this. How does God perform heart surgery? How does God perform heart surgery on these people and on us as well? And I understand this is particularly relevant uh, to some of you here who've been having heart problems recently. Um, Three things that God does. Firstly, he removes the stony heart. He removes the stony heart. Now you might say, how can our hearts be stony? Well, think for a minute about the characteristics of a stone. I don't know if you've ever had to do that before, but think about a stone and what a stone is like. If you went outside and found a stone and picked it up, just imagine what it would be like. It would probably be quite cold, wouldn't it? 
because it has nothing inside it to generate warmth and heat. It would be a cold stone. And sadly, our hearts can often be cold towards God, can't they? Perhaps we come to church, perhaps we sing the hymns, but actually within us, there's no desire to know God. There's no desire to meet with God and to worship him. We're uninterested. We're not bothered. We don't have that that warmth and that desire towards God. Actually, we're cold, like a stone. Or picture that stone again in your hand. It's not just cold, it's also hard, isn't it? A stone is a hard object. And our hearts can be hard towards God and his word. They can be stubborn, immovable, unchangeable, unwilling to listen to what God has to say and unwilling to to repent, to put God's word into practice, unwilling to trust him. The, The Bible has a word for that and it's called unbelief. So a stone is cold and hard But then a stone is also dead, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure if it's quite the right word to use because it was never living, but a stone is inert. There's nothing, there's there's, there's no arteries within it pumping blood. There's no action. A stone can't move itself, can it? A stone can't grow. A stone can't talk. It's inert. It's It's just a dull object. And our hearts can be like that sometimes. In fact, naturally, all of our hearts are like that. No spiritual life, unable to to help themselves, unable to live for God, unable to please God, our hearts can be dead and inert. Now think for a minute about some biblical examples of stony hearts. Think about Pharaoh. How did Pharaoh have a stony heart? Can you tell me? What was stony about Pharaoh's heart? He wouldn't listen, would he? And repeatedly God sent plagues upon the Egyptians and Pharaoh initially said, oh, okay, yeah, I'll let, the, I'll let the Jewish people go. And then as soon as the plague ended, he hardened his heart and he wouldn't listen anymore and he wouldn't respond to what the message God was sending through the plague and he became like a stone. And the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, And then God hardened it for him. There was no going back. Well, think about the children of Israel in the wilderness. They'd been rescued from Egypt. They were traveling through the wilderness and they had a problem. They were short on water. They were thirsty. And instead of trusting God, they rebelled. They rebelled against God and they rebelled against Moses. And we read a little bit about it in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 3. And it tells us um, in Hebrews 3, verse 15, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? You see, they were deceived by sin. They had so many reasons to trust God. They had so many reasons to obey God. But they got thirsty, they were deceived by sin, and they hardened their hearts against him. They had stony hearts. Or think about the parable of the sower. What happened to the seed that fell on the stony ground? Remember what happened to it? Sorry? It died, it withered. Yeah, it grew to start with, it began to grow. But then presumably when the sun came down on it, it didn't have any roots. There was no depth of soil below it. So it couldn't get any moisture. So it withered up and died. And that is a picture of those who initially perhaps hear God's word and they appear to respond to it. But they have no roots. They don't truly trust God. And so when difficulty and temptation comes along, they wither and fall away. Zechariah describes a heart like this as diamond hard. Diamond hard. Now, I don't own many, many diamonds. 
don't own any diamonds actually thinking about it, but I understand they're the hardest substance known to man. And Zechariah tells us that naturally speaking, our hearts are diamond hard to God. The Bible also tells us that those stony hard hearts have very serious consequences. In Romans 2 verse 5, we read, Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. Our stony, hard and cold, dead hearts are just causing wrath to be stored up. God is angry with our sinful hearts. And the day will come when he will judge and he will punish. That's what it means when it says wrath is being stored up for the day of judgment when those with rock-hard, diamond-hard hearts will be judged. But come back to Ezekiel 36, 26. What does he say? He says, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. How does God do that? How does God remove that heart of stone? Well, his operating theatre is at the cross, isn't it? Because when Christ went to that cross... He took all of the wrath that my stony heart deserves. He took all of the anger of God against my hard and cold heart. And he bore it for himself on that cross so that my heart of stone could be removed. Has your heart of stone been removed this morning? Has God taken your heart, your hardness, your coldness, your spiritual deadness and removed it? and laid it on Christ on the cross. So how does God perform heart surgery? Well, firstly, he removes the stony heart. But then we see in this verse that he does more than that. He says, I will give you a new heart. He replaces the heart of stone with a heart of flesh. Now, do you see the contrast there between the two things? Stone and flesh. Stone is cold. Flesh is warm. Stone is hard. Flesh is soft. Stone is dead. Never had any life at all. Whereas flesh is living. Here we have a total transformation. There's no similarity between the two things, is there? They're totally contrasted. And in John chapter 3 in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus refers to this change as being born again. It's a total dramatic change, all-encompassing. So what's this heart of flesh, this new heart, really like? Well, a heart of flesh is a heart that loves God. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6 the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God. Now there are people we like, but there are others who we love, aren't there? And a new heart of flesh is a heart that loves God. Why does it love him? Well, it loves him because he is the rescuer. He is the one who has dealt with the wrath that we deserve. And then a heart of flesh doesn't only love God, but it knows God as well. In Jeremiah we read, I will give them a heart to know me. Now that's personal, isn't it? That's not talking about an intellectual knowledge. That's not talking about um, an academic knowledge. That's talking about a personal knowledge. I've used this illustration before, but you probably won't remember. It was quite a while ago. I know of Prince William. I've seen him on the telly. Um, I've grown up with him in a sense. I've watched over the years as his hairline has receded. Um, I've watched as he's had various children. If you tested me hard enough, I'd probably remember their names. Um, I know he's married to Catherine. Um, I know lots about him. But I don't know him. I've never met him. I've never sat down with him. I've never talked to him man to man. I've never had a meal with him. I've never gone out and played football or done other things with him. I don't really know him. The heart of flesh doesn't just know of God. It knows God in a real, personal way. 
And then this heart of flesh is sensitive to God's word. Think about Josiah for a moment. Do you remember Josiah? He was king of Israel, king of Judah. And a man called Hilkiah went to the temple, and the temple was just full of rubbish. And Hilkiah and some others cleared out all of the rubbish out of the temple. And while they were doing that, they found a book. It was the book of the law. And so they read the book of the law. And someone took it and read it to the king. Do you remember what Josiah did when he heard the book of the law? Anyone remember what he did? Sorry? Did he? What did he do with it? He cut. <laughs> what did he cut? Is that the same occasion? Well, it might be. You might have got me there. Hmm, that's not what I'm thinking of. You might be right. I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm thinking of something else he cut or tore. He tore his clothes. And he tore his clothes and he wept and he cried out to God. And God came back to Josiah and he said this. He said, your heart was tender. You see, Josiah, when he heard God's word, had a tender heart, a sensitive heart, and he responded in repentance and humility. Come back to the parable of the sower. Think about the good ground this time. What happened to the seed that landed on the good ground? It grew and it bore fruit a hundredfold. And that there is a picture of a good heart, of a new heart of flesh that hears God's word. It responds, it responds, it meditates, it takes God's word and it puts it into practice and it bears fruit. So this heart of flesh, it knows God, it loves God, it's sensitive to God's word. And then it's like Christ. The Lord Jesus said, I am gentle and lowly in heart. If you have a heart of flesh, then you will be like Christ, gentle and lowly. Not proud, not puffed up, not haughty or exalted, not thinking you can do everything yourself, not thinking that you can live your life and please God under your own power, but leaning on God's strength, leaning on God's help leaning on his support. Does that describe your heart this morning? Has God given you that heart of flesh? Well, how does God perform heart surgery? Firstly, he takes away the stony heart. Secondly, he replaces it with a heart of flesh. And then thirdly, he fills it with his spirit. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. Back in the 1960s when heart transplants were first really being uh, tried and trialed, sadly they were often unsuccessful. Uh, they'd successfully managed to put, take away the old heart and put a new heart uh, in the patient and it might beat for a while. But most of the time, after a few hours, the heart would stop and the patient would die. The new heart just didn't have the life to keep going. But when God gives us a new heart, he fills it with his spirit. That word spirit literally means breath. It carries the idea of animation and of life. If something is breathing, then it's alive, isn't it? Uh, a few years ago, three years ago, I went in a first aid course, and one of the first things they asked us is, how do you tell if someone's alive? And one of the ways you tell is if they're breathing. Breath means life. And when God, the Holy Spirit, comes to live within a new heart, he brings animation and life with him. And remember what we said about the heart earlier. The heart is, is the center of who you really are. It's the seat of your emotions. It's the seat of your affections and your desires. That is where God the Holy Spirit comes to live, right in your center. 
Now, when you live with someone for any amount of time, they start to rub off on you, don't they? You pick up some of their phrases and some of their characteristics. You start to act a little bit like they act. Um, I don't live with my dad anymore, but people regularly say to me that I'm a chip off the old block and I'm a lot like my dad. And uh, I am losing my hair, so perhaps, um, perhaps that is the case. But when God the Holy Spirit lives with us for a length of time, we become like him. His attitudes, his desires, they start to rub off on us. His words and his laws become delightful. They become a joy. We're pleased to follow them and to keep them. And the pattern of our lives becomes a pattern of obedience. Look at verse 27 there in Ezekiel 36. He says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. In the winter, if you go for a walk, you might get cold, might you? If you forget your hat, your ears will probably get a bit chilly at the moment. And when I get home from a cold winter's walk, the first thing I like to do after taking my wellies off is to have a nice hot cup of tea. And when you have a hot drink when your body's cold, you know what happens, don't you? You can feel it going down your throat to your insides. And it spreads, doesn't it? The warmth spreads from your centre out to your fingers and to your toes. And you feel it spreading throughout your body. Well, when God the Holy Spirit dwells within our hearts, that spreads from the inside to our outward actions as well, doesn't it? Think about these Jewish exiles that Ezekiel was speaking to. Before they'd been given their new hearts, they were unfaithful. They were immoral. They were corrupt. They were idol worshippers. But now that God is going to give them a new heart and fill it with their spirit, he says they're going to be able to walk in his ways. They're going to be able to keep his law. They're going to be faithful. They're going to be moral. They're no longer going to worship idols, but they'll worship the living God. Their hearts, their lives, will be bearing fruit. And we see that truth in the New Testament as well, don't we? In Galatians 5, where we read about the fruit of the Spirit. When God, the Holy Spirit, lives within us, we bear his fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the actions of a life, of a heart, that is filled with God's Spirit. Does that describe your heart? Is the pattern of your life one of growing? You won't always be perfect, you will still sin. But are you generally growing in these fruits? Are you becoming more like Christ? If God is, has filled your heart with his spirit, that should be the case within you. So how does God perform heart surgery? Well, here in Ezekiel 36, 26, we see three ways, three things he does. He removes our heart of stone. He replaces it with a heart of flesh. And he fills it with his spirit. Now, all of us have a lot in common with these Jewish exiles that Ezekiel is speaking to. Because naturally speaking, our hearts are cold and hard and dead towards God. We need this surgery, don't we? Each one of us needs spiritual heart surgery. And you know, we can't do it ourselves. Imagine a, a patient in a hospital in the operating theatre uh, coming in and sitting down and saying to the surgeon, right, what would you like me to do? What can I do? Let me help. The surgeon would probably say, I've, I've not had it happen to me, but I imagine the surgeon would say, lie down. Um, I'm going to knock you out. You do nothing. <laughs> Just lie there. And we can contribute nothing to this work of God. It's interesting that if you, if you work through this passage in Ezekiel, you see that God repeatedly says, I will. So just have a look with me at verse 23. In verse 23, he says, I will vindicate. In verse 24, he says, I will take. Verse 25, I will sprinkle, I will cleanse. 
Verse 26, I will give you a new heart. I will put this new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of flesh. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you. Uh, at the end of verse 28, I will be your God. Verse 29, I will deliver. And it goes on and on and on. I will, I will, I will. It, this new heart surgery is a work of God. He will do it. It's his work of grace and power. So this morning we should praise the Lord that he is the master surgeon. And we should praise him that he invites us to come to him and to be his patients. This morning he calls on each of us to come, to realise that we need this surgery and to come to him because he alone can give us the cure. Well, as we start 2024, will you commit to keeping your heart with all diligence? If you've had this heart surgery, if your heart of stone has been removed and been replaced with a heart of flesh, if you've been filled with God's Spirit, will you commit to taking care of your heart and keeping it? Will you seek to know and love the Lord? Will you be sensitive to his word? Will you be tender? Will you respond to his word? Will you live in his spirit? And will you pray for others? Will you pray for others that they will receive that same heart surgery that you have? Ezekiel 36, 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. We're going to come to our, our closing hymn. 739. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that always feels thy blood so freely shed for me. And then verse 5 says, Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart, come quickly from above, Write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love.
Heavenly Father, we would say sorry this morning for our stony hearts. Father, forgive us for the times that we're hard and cold to you and your word. Father, we thank you that we have this wonderful description of the heart surgery that you can do for each one of us. Nothing that we can contribute, but all of your grace. Father, we thank you for Christ and what he achieved on that cross, taking our sins upon himself so that we could be given a new heart and filled with your spirit. Father, we pray that this year you would help us each to keep our hearts and to love you for that great work that you've done. So, Father, we praise you this morning and we thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>